Good morning and welcome to the Community Voice. I'm Steve Braddock, your host. Delighted to have you with us on this beautiful morning and it's going to be a great week and we're just thankful that you're listening. We're thankful to our sponsors, Tanner Health System and Oak Mountain Academy. And we have a very special guest in the morning, I shall say, very special guest. Thank you. You're in that category, Carroll County Probate Judge Edie Haney. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Doing great. Good. Glad to be here on a Monday morning. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, let me do a little uh, bio resume intro, and then we'll get right into the world of being a probate judge. Um, yes. Edie's extensive, uh, probate judge Edie Haney's extensive experience includes average advising startup and early stage companies having practice as a partner with the regional law firm Tysinger Vance. In the commercial and transactional law section, specializing in taxation, property, and corporate law. Sounds like fun. Yes, absolutely. Uh, exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ms. Haney also previously served as corporate counsel for a large multi-state consulting and valuation company and also a multi-state commercial development contractor. Edie is a graduate of Walter F. George School of Mercer University, where she graduated cum laude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's my southern uh, Latin for you. And the uh, University of West Georgia with her BS. Um, she uh, served uh, on the University of West Georgia Foundation. She continues to serve on the Circles uh, Board of Directors. And the Carroll County Mental Health Advocates, and we're going to talk about that in our third segment because that's near and dear to the heart of uh, Judge Haney. Absolutely. She was appointed in 2018 to the judgeship, and she was elected in 2020. That's right. How about that for an intro? That's a great intro. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, and that's the show for today. (laughs) Okay, let's start off. The probate judge uh, has always baffled me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because it's like, it does everything. So I don't really understand what it is it does and what it's not supposed to do because it seems like it does everything. It's it's very unusual to me. It's a little bit of a catch-all. And I think one thing... I learned a lot about probate judges after I did practice probate law when I was at Tysinger. So I'm familiar with estates, trusts, guardianships before I started yeah. my job. But there were a lot of things I was not familiar with. And we're going to talk about some of those um, you and I already discussed. But one thing that I did learn is that the probate judge is a constitutional officer. And so our county has four constitutional officers. There are four positions, sheriff, clerk of court probate judge and tax commissioner that the Georgia Constitution requires every county to have. So if you think about those positions, sheriff, clerk of court, tax commissioner, and probate judge, basically, I've come to believe that probate judge is kind of a a catch-all. And so any kind of official function that needed to be performed originally that didn't fit in one of the other categories, law enforcement, um, taxes, the actual court system falls under probate judge. And so there's all kinds of fun little things that we have, like fireworks licensing, um, (laughs) peddlers licensing. Actually, they did away with that this year. But yes, veterans have a special exemption (laughs) from, I think, occupational tax. And so all those kind of little crazy, every now and then they'll come in, they're like, oh, by the way, you do this. So that's been interesting to learn. Elaborate just a, a moment, if you would, about being a constitutional officer, because that's that's particularly significant. It my, is. And, and we talk about the sheriff, we talk about probate judge, but that is something that gives you, in, in a sense, or in reality, an autonomy that's in right. terms of your service and who you are, what you do, and, and who you answer to, correct? That's right. We answered, we are elected officials, like many are, but we answer directly to the populace, the public. And so... Although we are under the county system for employment purposes, just for ease of operation, um, our budget is approved by the county commissioners. Um, so we work with the commissioners um, in that respect. But but we are answerable to the pu- the public that elects us, our electorate. Mm-hmm. So we're directly responsible. Well, let's jump into the, the when it comes to probate court, uh, it seems like the biggest topic is, is wills and probating a will. Estates. In mm-hmm. the states and all that uh, stuff. And um, tell us, just give us a general overview of uh, your responsibilities. There. Okay. Um, actually, any estate comes through probate court if there are assets in the estate generally. Um, so some of, the, some of the estates have wills, some of them do not have wills. Um, I used to tell people when I practiced that um, you need to have a will because if 
you don't have a plan for the distribution of your assets or what's going to happen when you die, the state has a plan for you. So there is there are laws that say, okay, if there's no will, these are, this is who will receive the assets. Um, and it's the probate's court probate court's job to oversee all of that. And so basically the probate court is responsible for determining, first of all, is there a will? Is that will a valid will? Um, And going through the process to allow people to um, have an opportunity to review the will, to object to it, um, to agree to it, to say, okay, this is the will. And then to make sure that the will is carried out to some extent. Um, If you have a will, you can determine how much court oversight there is. But if you don't have a will, then you have an administration. And so the probate court is also responsible for overseeing all administration. So if there's not a will, who's going to be responsible for that estate? Who's going to be the administrator? Who are the heirs of that estate? Who who do the assets go to? Um, and making sure that, again, that estate is carried out according to the laws of the state of Georgia. You said that the state, if you don't have a will, the state has a plan for you. Now right. That, that's kind of intimidating right there. That's well, if you think of it from this perspective, and again, I would always tell my clients, the legislators, the legislature, and will law is old law, and a state law is, has been around a long time. It's always being fine-tuned and tweaked, but it's been in place a long time. And the, the goal is to say, okay, we have to assume what people would want. And so we assume that if you don't say, we have to assume what people would want. And so what they what it goes by is next of kin. So example, if it's just you and your spouse and you pass away, they assume you wanted everything to go to your spouse. But if you have a spouse and children, then the state assumes you would want it to go to your spouse and children. And that's a big, that's a big issue if you've got minor children, because then you have to work that out. Does, it, does the state take a chunk of it, if, uh, for lack of a better phrase, if there is no will? No. Because no. I've often heard that, that you no. don't want it all to go to the government. Right, and that's, that's a, um, I, I would say that may, that's maybe true in some states. Georgia has one of the easiest probate processes. I know people who've gone through probate may not agree with that, but it does have one well, of I've the easiest probate processes. My sister's yes. in Florida, and I, I yes. hear Georgia probate is really uh, sweet. Right, and in Florida and the Carolinas, I believe the same is true. You try to avoid probate at all costs because the cost of your probate is associated with the size of your estate, and you do pay a portion. So Georgia is not like that. I will say, though, without a will, invariably the cost is higher because their bond is required. Um, You have to do more publishing. Um, There's just a number of costs that go along with not having a will. And if you have a will, you can waive those costs. Okay, so um, um, what what do you recommend? Should should everybody get an attorney to do a will, or should we? And I've got some stories about that. How, I know. You, know you got your brother in law who's a quote unquote lawyer, and you right. know, and who should do your will, or should you just do it yourself? I'm of the opinion, and again, I come from a legal background. I was a probate lawyer, but I, but also as a probate judge, I, I think that that's people don't realize um, what difference it makes to have a will, and what difference it makes to have a will that's done correctly. And so, I would say it is important to have an attorney who has some expertise in probate law, because they will make sure that your will has the provisions that allow your administrator to waive bond, to waive returns and reports to the court, that it has the language that makes sure your assets go where you want them to go, and they'll help you think of things you may not have thought about. Make sure you've covered all your assets, um, insurance, retirement plans, things that you may not have thought about. Um, So, I do feel like it's important very often it's not required and I will say that I have wills all the time that someone has either handwritten again it's very the requirements of a will are very specific too um, it has to be witnessed by two people who see each other see the testator or not see the testator sign but the testators ask them to sign as witnesses to the will it does not have to be notarized again I, I can't give complete legal advice on that but I will say the requirements are very technical and so someone may write out something thinking they've done a will but it may not meet Georgia law and also although this is not in your uh, purview but I would think there's IRS concerns about uh, that would lend itself to having a good solid will depending on the size of the estate now that that 
vary. So again, that's another reason to at least consult a lawyer yeah. because it does vary. They change the amount that's subject to federal estate tax changes over time. Right now it's pretty high. And so most estates in Carroll County don't meet that threshold, but they change it from time to time. So yeah. that's another reason to consider. Uh, another thing that comes up often is I know um, even when I was practicing online wills that you can get a copy of a will online. Mm-hmm. I would tell my clients then, um, and again, I'm not can't give legal advice, but I would say at least have an attorney look at it because it generally those documents don't include the provisions of Georgia law that make it so easy, make probate easy. And if you're if you're going to have a will, you want it to be easy for your family. Our guest this morning is Carroll County Probate Judge Edie Haney. We're unpacking the many many responsibilities and roles of the probate court in Carroll County. And we're on Facebook Live. You can post any questions there. You can even call in. Guess what? 678-601-TALK. And we'll be back with more after this word. Travel, get-togethers, Sunday morning worship. COVID-19 has almost put a stop to our way of life. Vaccination is our best shot at getting back to normal. The COVID-19 vaccine is based on more than a decade of research. Trials show it's safe and can provide up to 95% protection when you've received both doses. Tanner is committed to making the vaccine as widely available as possible, giving you a shot at getting back to life. Until then, keep wearing your mask, washing your hands, and avoid gatherings. Learn more and get updates at tanner.org slash vaccine. At Oak Mountain Academy, our academic excellence shines through innovation and a personalized educational experience. Our pre-K 3 through 12th grade environment offers a family-oriented atmosphere. We are an independent school with faith-based values and an academy honor code. Our academic standards prepare our students for college and beyond. I'm Patrick Duran, Headmaster, inviting you to visit us on the mountain or at oakmountain.us. Come see how our warriors are creating legacies. Good morning. Welcome back to the Community Voice. I'm Steve Craddock, your host. Delighted to have you with us. We're coming. And that was the Doobie Brothers here on WLBB. Okay. Uh, James Camp wants to know, does anyone remember when probate judges used to be called the county ordinary? That's right. I still have the, um, that's one of my pieces of memorabilia that lives in my office. And well, y'all it, it are pretty extra, ordinary. Well, that's y'all right. are pretty extraordinary. Right. Why, I'm why, sure that's why they changed that. <laughs> why Why did they call it a county ordinary? Do you know? I do not know. Isn't I wish I weird? did know that piece of trivia, but that is correct. The probate judge was the county ordinary. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of this that I know has got to be uh, emotionally hard on you and, and your staff. I mean, this is, the, and we're talking about wills and we kind of blow through that, but I think we've all seen families that have disintegrated because of the will and the the debate over the state. One thing that you do have to deal with is guardianships. That's right. And be it adult or minor or even property. What... um, what are some of the challenges you face? Tell, tell us about the role of the probate court with guardianships and some okay. of the challenges you face. Um, the probate court has what they call original jurisdiction of all of adult guardianships and conservatorships. So um, in fairly recent history in Georgia law, they changed. We originally had a guardian of the property and a guardian of the person. Um, a gar- our guardian of the property is now called a conservator. So the probate court has original jurisdiction of guardianships and conservators of adults. Um, we also have a jurisdiction of temporary, which are basically consent guardianships, but temporary guardianships of minors, where the parents agree that someone else should take custody of a minor for a limited period of time um, and conservatorships of minors come through our court so those are the things that we see in our court um, I would say I think it's the guardianship and and conservatorship those typically go hand in hand are particularly difficult because they're particularly difficult for the family generally that's a difficult decision to make that this is where you are in the phase of life um, and depending on how far down that road 
the person is for the guard that they're seeking guardianship of conservatorship to have to make that decision and determine is this necessary or not um, to have a guardian and conservator. I will say there is some flexibility in what powers you can give to the guardian or the conservator and what powers are retained by the ward, what rights are retained by the ward, the right to vote. Um, Every now and then I had somebody recently asked to retain the right to drive. Um, Some things like that, the right to change your domicile, where you live. Um, The court can determine what things need to be handled by a third party, um, a guardian or conservator, and what things the ward retains. So that's some flexibility. In your uh, in your previous life, taxation, property, and corporate law, <laughs> you um, I doubt you encountered this kind of deep emotional uh, challenges. Correct? Well, I did I did practice probate law at Tysinger, and okay. so I I was so you were familiar. To it. mm-hmm. It's a whole different ball game, so to speak, though, to be on the other side when you're the one who has to make the decision. Right. When you're advocating and you're either representing a ward or a person who's applying for guardianship or conservatorship, you're an advocate and you're advancing a position. When you're the judge, you're making the determination. Now we're talking, we're talking heart-wrenching, we? I mean, heart-wrenching type of uh, emotional, devastating type of... Uh, be it the will or the estates or guardianships. This is tough stuff. These are emotional times for families. And for me, as the probate judge, I, honestly, I expected it to be, I, I wondered if I'd be able to make those decisions. But the fact is, it is my job, and I am the one. Someone has to make a decision, and I am the one. I'm tasked with that responsibility. But I do... Um, I do try to do that with compassion and um, with fairness. It's so important that you try to take in as much information as you can and weigh that information appropriately. But I do recognize the weight of the decisions that I'm called to make. Mm -hmm. Uh, If if I appear a little distracted, a giant forklift is driving around our parking lot. (laughs) That's the beauty of live radio. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, let's shift gears a bit. Uh, uh, let's talk about uh, weapons carry, concealed carry, licenses. Yes, uh, that's a very hot topic right hot now. Hot topic, good. It is, well, yes. Yeah, that's all we want is a hot topic, <laughs> but a very important one. Tell right. us, um, the numbers have been somewhat, of, no pun intended, explosive, but uh, <laughs> tell, us, uh, that's right. tell us about uh, the concealed carry permits over the last couple of years and where we are now with them. I I have looked at the last couple of years, and I know that we've had an increase. I don't recall, I didn't bring those with me, and I don't recall off the top of my head what they've been the last several years, but they have gone up dramatically. Um, I do know, I've recently looked at last year, which in, again was the pandemic year, and so I had one month that the state closed or didn't close the court, but didn't we didn't issue licenses for one month until, until it was officially determined that that was an essential service and so we we were we did um, not issue one month but we began issuing again after that month as it was deemed an essential service um, I will say last year even with that month where we did not we averaged um, 350 licenses a month and we are currently averaging for this year I I think when I looked at it most recently, we're averaging right at 530 a month. And again, part of that is trying to move along our application process. Right now, we're appointment only for um, licensed carry, but we have expanded our appointments. And so if you went on and we do our appointments, we have an online appointment system. And if you go online, you can get an appointment in the next week or so. So that's, a that's been an increase. It is. It's a, it's a very have, have any of these people who have applied who are applying for this? Uh, are they kind of shared with you what their motivation is? They have, and I don't know how appropriate <laughs> that is, is that to say. Attorney Klein, George, uh, well, George Klein I mean, you do yeah. hear comments as people come through, and people talk to me um, in in the community, and I think just definitely the anytime you have uncertainty, okay. anytime there's uncertainty, so any change in administration. There comes some cha- there comes some uncertainty. What's going to happen? Are the laws going to change? And, and again, I, I don't know of any. People do say they've heard the laws are going to change. I am not familiar with any 
right. dramatic changes that are coming. But, but any time that happens, there's a change. Now, you mentioned you're a constitutional officer, but now yes. the, with concealed carry or weapons carry, that's a state law, correct? It is. Okay. It is a so, state law. So basically, you don't have any role beyond except the administration. It's the issuance that I'm responsible for, you're, issuing the license. You're and responsible so, for the issuance, and that doesn't right. give you any real latitude. No. Well, no, there's there are state prohibitors and there are federal prohibitors. And so as I see my role, my role is to look at the license and see if the state or federal law prohibits that person from having a license. And they're very there's a lot of detail to those laws. And that's been one thing that I did not have experience with and I've had to learn. But I've gone to numerous conferences. I've educated i mean i am familiar with those laws now but as far as the actual carry laws um those are available on the um sheriff's website georgiacarry.org has all the georgia gun laws and and what it looks like to carry in other states so that's where you would find the actual carry laws each of these topics we could spend a whole program on but uh, i want to get to something that uh hopefully will give us a laugh or two or maybe it won't maybe it'll give (laughs) make us shed a tear let's talk about marriage licenses okay and now you do that too but now you don't actually marry people do you in the probate court, we do not marry people. And again, that is a scheduling issue, but essentially. But now, who, who does? Alton Johnson? Um, any affi- there, Well, one of the reasons is anyone, almost anyone can become an officiant at this point. You can become an officiant online relatively easy. Um, but there are a number of other judges that do. Dennis Blackman, Judge Blackman. Um, he marries people? Oh, he loves to marry people, is really? my understanding. Yes, yeah, he's, but he's um, Judge Simpson marries. So there are judges you'd communicate with there. We we can give them, give people contact information for those that are, are willing to consider so, it. But, so, but they come to you for a marriage license. They come to me for licensing, So yes. what, what are some of the, uh, I mean, how does it work? I mean, in terms of, uh, are you seeing a lot of young couples? Are you seeing a lot of peculiar situations or what? No, you see all, you see all situations. I will say that um, the law changed a little bit and that you cannot get married if you're under 17. It used to be that you could get married with your parents permission but that's changed but that's effective july 1st that was effective okay mm-hmm. previous that was that effective was last year last year so mm-hmm. you got to be 17 or older to get married in that's georgia right. mm-hmm. what's alabama that's right. do you know i do not know no, I'll have to, ch- <laughs> have to check on that <laughs> i uh, do not know do you have it like any marriage situations that just really warmed your heart and you know they traveled many miles and they're together and blah 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 well i will say uh, one thing that is unusual is that you can um you can get your license all over Georgia and so people do I have had people come who were going to get married in Georgia and get their license here so that's that's always fun to do to have people come well we're going to take a break come back one thing that's near and dear to your heart as we mentioned earlier is mental health so we're going to talk about the role of uh, probate court in that realm and some of your thoughts and uh, opinions but when we come back after this word from Oak Mountain Academy and Tanner Health System Travel, get-togethers, Sunday morning worship. COVID-19 has almost put a stop to our way of life. Vaccination is our best shot at getting back to normal. The COVID-19 vaccine is based on more than a decade of research. Trials show it's safe and can provide up to 95% protection when you've received both doses. Tanner is committed to making the vaccine as widely available as possible, giving you a shot at getting back to life. Until then, keep wearing your mask, washing your hands, and avoid gatherings. Learn more and get updates at tanner.org slash vaccine. As a graduate of Oak Mountain Academy, I found that my experience on the mountain prepared me beyond all expectations. As a junior at Auburn University, I approached my studies with great confidence thanks to what I learned at OMA. When I think back on my time on the mountain, I think of my teachers. Their genuine love and concern for me as a student was always evident. And now, as an adult, I still foster those relationships. I'm Carly Robinson, an Oak Mountain Academy alum. Visit oakmountain.us to see how you can offer your child an amazing opportunity to be a warrior. Hola, and welcome back to the Community Voice. I'm Steve Gratic, your host. We're having a good time this morning with probate judge Edie Haney from the great county of Carroll. Um, okay, mental health, uh, near and dear to your heart. 
Uh, tell us about the role uh, of probate court when it comes to that. All right. Um, this was another area that, like you said, I was not familiar with. And if anything does pull at my heartstrings, it is the mental health. And um, so the probate court, because we have Willowbrook in our community, the probate court is responsible for involuntary commitments. And so um, if a patient is at Willowbrook and they are not willing to stay voluntarily, they believe they should be released, but Willowbrook um, is of the medical opinion that they're not ready to be released and that they require further um, behavioral treatment, then there's a very specific procedure that you go through in probate court where the staff at Willowbrook can apply for to keep that person involuntarily. And again, it's a very, very specific procedure, very specific time frames, um, very specific criteria that you meet. And so the probate, but the probate court is responsible in that realm of involuntary commitments and there are um, other anytime you have an involuntary commitment that again is the original and exclusive jurisdiction of the probate court so we're responsible for that Um, but what I and so we do see that on a semi-regular basis Um, but also the probate court is responsible for what's called an order to apprehend and so if someone in the community in our county um, is displaying behavior that seems to indicate they need mental health treatment. Then the probate court, on the testimony of two individuals who've seen that behavior in the last 48 hours, can order that person to be taken for evaluation to a behavioral health facility, to an emergency receiving facility. Um, Again, that is not an order for treatment. That is not an order um, for involuntary commitment. It's, It's only an order for evaluation and so but the probate court orders that and then the receiving facility which is a behavioral health facility determines does this person require some mental health treatment and do we need to keep them for a short period of time either to further to further assess or for further treatment if necessary so that is i say it's heart-wrenching because what i hear um on a weekly basis are families um, who have family members that are suffering a mental health crisis and they're just at their wits end. They don't know what to do. And somewhere they found out generally from law enforcement or um, sometimes our mental health advocates that the order to apprehend is an option to at least to have to begin the process of trying to seek help for that person. So we've only got a, <clears throat> a little over a minute left, so okay. you have to keep this to, <laughs> to 60 seconds. Is Carroll County doing a better job than in re- recent years in terms of dealing with our mental health issues? Carroll County is is a beacon for the state is what I would say, and the nation, Why? the mental health, because our, our we have adopted the mental health advocates. Um, we have the mobile crisis response team. Um, we were selected as one of nine communities in the United States to be a community of care um, to, from the um, Department of Behavioral Health to get assistance because of the dramatic strides that, that we've taken. They, they've adopted us to partner with for a I think it's a year um, to assist us with mental health because of the dramatic strides we've taken and we congratulate you on that because I know you play an important role and well, we thank you for we you. need to congratulate Judge Betty Kaysen who got us started and Jody Goodman who's the director of the mental health advocates because they are truly our heroes in that fight absolutely and we <laughs> salute you and your staff for all the fine work that you do and we thank you for listening to the Community Voice here on WLBB, Carrollton.